Well, we had a great morning session, and now we're looking forward to having just an incredible afternoon session. And again, I know everybody is going to also enjoy our next speaker. Georgia Chakiris is the administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, Region 6 office. And Region 6 is based in Fort Worth, and they're comprised of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and the Indian Nations. And Georgia has been with NHTSA since 1987, and she's widely recognized for contributions to highway safety programs. And prior to position as the regional administrator with NHTSA, she was the administrator of the Ohio Office of the Governor's Highway Safety Representative. And it's my pleasure to bring up Georgia. She's an incredible traffic safety advocate for Texas. So, Georgia, we're glad to have you today. So. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here and to join all of you for lunch. And I'd like to say a picnic because picnics are family times. And so keep on eating. And I look forward to just having a chat with you today about this issue. But I first wanted to thank uh, USAA, uh, the Shriners Hospital, and the Texas Department of Transportation for hosting this meeting. Great things happen from calling the first meeting, and I believe that's what we have here. The expertise is out here in the audience, not necessarily the folks that are up here. And bringing you all together is an important step in addressing the problem of distracted driving. Just like any of the other highway safety issues that we have, we all do a lot individually, but when we can come together with a plan, we can do so much more. I'd also like to say thank you to our brave victim advocates uh, for being here and sharing their stories and putting a face on the numbers. The numbers that I'm going to talk to you about today. We have to remember that each one of those numbers has a story to it. And it's those stories that have kept highway safety advocates like me centered and focused on the issues. I've had the privilege and the blessing to be involved in uh, working to save lives and reduce injuries on our highways my entire career. And it's been heartening to know that we're, probably, we're at our most historic time in the highway safety since I've been involved because we are at the lowest fatality rates and levels we've ever been. And I know that's not a consolation for those people who have lost loved ones, but the real information that we get from that is what we're doing is working, that we do have some solutions to some of the problems that we're seeing. We just need to focus on them. We are now at the lowest uh, levels of impaired driving-related fatalities, we have the highest belt use ever, but we do see areas like distracted driving rising when we look at the numbers. Now, I have a PowerPoint today, and unlike our young folks, I am challenged at doing anything technical at the same time I do anything else. So speaking and running this at the same time, uh, please bear with me. When we talk about the numbers, and you've heard a number of these things already this morning, it doesn't seem like a lot when you say that 5% of the drivers are holding uh, cell phones and talking or doing whatever with them at any one time. But when you translate that into the actual numbers at any given moment, over 600,000 people or 600,000 drivers are engaged in that activity while they're driving. It becomes more significant, and that's why it's important to us to look at the numbers. Our highway safety programs over the years are what we call data-driven, and we use those numbers to tell us what we're doing right and what we're not doing right. And that has allowed us to make progress in a number of areas, and I believe the numbers will help us focus on the distracted driving issue and make a difference. 
Over 3,000 lives were lost due to distracted driving based on police crash reports. Now that's important to know because police crash reports from one state to the other are not the same. They don't ask the same questions of law enforcement officers. They don't have the same blocks to check off. Distracted driving it carries a myriad of issues that we've heard about today. So in some states the information is not very specific. Uh, many states have um, added specific blocks for cell phone use. Um, many of them don't include whether they were, used, they were texting or if they were just talking on the phone. So we can probably figure out that this is the minimum number of distracted driving related fatalities. We need to do a better job of improving the data that we have available to us. Take a look at this particular um, graph, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but what's interesting here is the blue line. And we heard in our previous se session, which I thought was very interesting, having in my early years taught driver's education, some things have changed and some things haven't changed. Uh, from being working with young people. But we see that the drivers who are the least experienced in the driving task are also the ones who use cell phones, handheld cell phones the most. Now you look at that and you see, well, why did it go down at any particular time? And we have to sometimes, when an analyzing the, the data, is maybe that's because we had a lot more hands-free devices coming on board, not necessarily that we had a lot fewer people using uh, cell phones. Next, we see the big difference between manipulating handheld devices while driving, and this probably gives us our biggest indication of texting issue, and that our young drivers are also the ones who do the most texting, and we're not surprised by that by, from what we hear. Not quite sure why we had uh, the little blip there at, that went down in 2009. Hopefully it's because some of our messages were getting across and more people were using hands-free devices to talk rather than text. But I'm not surprised that the line is going back up. And that's because we, as we heard earlier today, we have young people who text a hundred texts a day, two hundred texts a day, or more. Sounds to me like they can't even go to the bathroom without texting. So what do we expect that's going to be different about getting behind the wheel? Now, this is what teens tell us in surveys. One in four teens say that they have texted while driving. And 48% say that they have been with someone as a passenger who has been texting behind the wheel. Now, they're willing, more willing to admit that somebody else was doing it than that they themselves were doing it. And that's something that hasn't changed over the years. Teens are still always willing somebody else has been doing it rather than taking responsibility. And maybe it's not just teens, it's the public in general. We see that one in four teens of driving age say they have texted while driving and half of all teens say they've been the passenger. So that's part of a distracted driving survey that happened in 2009. What we see in a new survey that uh, has just been conducted in 2011 is that 18% of the drivers said they have sent text messages or emails while driving. And one third of the drivers between 18 to 24, and these are not just the kids, and so we know that the very young ones are doing it even more, that they can take their eyes off the road from up to 10 seconds 
before they feel that they are significantly impairing their driving. Okay, those of you who are not eating, put your hands up here like you're driving. Close your eyes. One, two, three. Anybody get nervous? Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Can you believe it? It's amazing to me that you could spend that much time with your eyes off the road and actually stay on, but not to feel that you're significantly impairing your driving abilities. So yes, maybe it's the attitude that's getting young people to think that it's all right to text and drive, but I, I sincerely believe it's the invincible feeling that young people have that nothing is going to happen to me that makes them believe that it's okay. And then here's the latest survey, and I think some of you may have heard this because it, it made the news, that as a passenger, the younger the driver, the less likely they are to say anything. The younger the passenger, the less likely they are to say anything to a driver who is texting. So you know if you're a parent of a teen and they're going to travel in a car with other friends, that they're not very likely to say something to that driver if they see them doing something that's unsafe. And that has not changed over the years. The reason may be different. It's speeding or not wearing a belt or whatever. Young people are very reluctant to say something, and that's that peer pressure issue to someone else who's driving, even if they know that they're doing something that's unsafe. What does all this say about our future? We're seeing how bad it is right now, or we're seeing the level of texting that's involved in young people's lives now. What about the future? I'm telling you, this is actually a toy that was being advertised. It is a keychain and a cell phone for, for little ones. So when our toddlers grow up and reach driving age, it's only going to expand unless we do something to make texting and driving, using a cell phone, culturally unacceptable in this country and here in Texas. We talk about distracted driving and Everybody feels, well, I do it from time to time. It's not as bad as an impaired driver. An impaired driver is distracted because of taking or taking a drink or some type of a drug. But what we're doing here is an, is an addiction almost, the same thing. And we have to look at this as seriously as we do impaired driving. And we're all here. And you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested in the distracted driving issue and I believe in doing something about it. And one of the things I wanted to share with you is that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has a goal to eliminate distracted driving. And by doing that, we started out with the development of a plan and we developed this plan based on a national distracted driving summit where we got input from people all across this country, experts all across this country, including some of you who I know were there. This plan has four initiatives to it, and the number one initiative is to improve the data. And this data is very important to us, not only in telling us exactly what issues and how to focus countermeasures, but also in letting the public know the severity of the problem. Without the numbers, it's very difficult to convince people that it is an issue. 
And as was mentioned before, if you had an airplane crash each day, people would take notice. It gets in the media. Unfortunately, automobile crashes happen one at a time in different communities, in different media spheres, so not everybody hears about them. I was amazed after working in highway safety for some years and talking to a group of ministers about traffic safety and the need to get them involved. And at the time, the fatality, number of fatalities in this country was 43,000. I thought everybody knew how, how terrible a problem public health, number one public health issue in this country was motor vehicle fatalities. They weren't. And they said, why don't we know this? We should because we're the ones who are involved with the families who experience this. But they experience it one at a time. We have to remember as advocates that the public is not focused necessarily on our issue. But we have an opportunity with distracted driving because I have to tell you, for the first time, the general public is interested in this topic. Now, it might be more because people have inconvenienced them, because they haven't seen the stoplight change and they've seen that they've been on the phone. But whatever the reason is, this is an opportunity for us to garner that support, round it up, and use it for all of our traffic safety issues. Data is the foundation of all of the programs and good solid programs and we're going to be working with states across this country to try to shore up uh, the crash data. We will continue to do surveys and research studies and we will look at all of the research that has been done by anybody across this country to help us give clues as to what should be our next steps. The next initiatives have to do with the vehicle, and one is to try to reduce the distractions that are within the vehicle, and we know that the public wants entertainment and communication access, and if the manufacturers offer it, they'll buy it. I was at a stoplight oh, a month or so ago, and it was in the evening, and I'm seeing this flashing going up in the car in front of me. The driver had strapped an iPad to the rear view mirror and was watching a movie. If it was available to them in the vehicle, they'll use it. So with the leadership of, sec leadership of Secretary LaHood, we really have entered into an era of trying to work with manufacturers to voluntarily do the right thing. And all of this information is on the website that Secretary LaHood mentioned, uh, distracteddriving.gov. So you can get the specifics about the infer about our plan. But this plan, as far as vehicles, is working on trying to develop tasks within the vehicle that don't go more than two seconds. So that a driver can, using one hand, take care of the task in two seconds or less. Even at that time, you know lots of things can happen on the road. But we have to be understanding that if it's not offered safely in the vehicle, people will figure out how to do it. And that might mean strapping it on the rear view mirror. Hopefully not too many. The other area is technology that will help with crash avoidance warning systems. And I tell you, I had the the privilege of helping to test some of that on the Texas Motor Speedway uh, earlier this year and to see the incredible help that this crash avoidance warning systems can be to all of us where if there is a driver who stops suddenly in front of that truck you're behind you would get a warning to let you know that that happens. Or that if somebody coming as you're entering the intersection is coming faster than they could possibly stop, it'll let you know. 
Now these are only tools. It's not a replacement for a driver paying attention to the driving task. But there are some very important things that we can do to help in improving the driving task and continue to drive down the number of fatalities that occur each year. And the fourth one is probably the initiative that's most challenging and the one that we have been talking about here a lot today, and that is getting the message out to the public and getting the public to take action. And that's where we're going to need your help the most. Whatever the message is from the state, whether, and I've probably forgotten to use, go through my slides here. We all go. Whatever the message is that the state uses, it is an important one. And I wanted to flip through here and let you know that one of the steps in our messaging is also to, to recommend and pass state text messaging bans. You hear a lot of words about, well, it's not enforceable. Well, there are some demonstration projects that you'll hear in more detail this afternoon uh, that we have been involved in and that Secretary LaHood mentioned. So we can show that they are enforceable. But there's another reason for passing text messaging bans and cell phone uh, limitations. It's because it sends a message to the public that it's important. It's a great way to get that message out there. At least a parent will be telling the youngster, you can't text and drive because you might get a ticket. It's against the law. It helps give parents who unfortunately don't always uh, take the initiative, and as a, an ex-driver ed teacher I can tell you that's the case, to take that next step. It gives them the backup to, do, to let their teenager know that it's not acceptable, it's against the law. So there are, there's a two-fold benefit from these laws. This uh, map is changing as we speak. Idaho has recently uh, passed a law on a cell phone use, ban on cell phone use, and so has West Virginia. We hope to see this particular map fill out completely but it's going to take people like you to help that happen. Of course, we still have a long ways to go to, to make that happen. And whatever your message is, whether it's talk, text, crash here in Texas, or it's one text or call could wreck it all, these are important messages to get out to the public. And to everybody that you talk to, getting them to not only take a personal responsibility for it, but to take the next step and talk to, say, at least two more people. Or talk to the businesses in their community. Bring their community together. One of the things that um, I'd like to recommend the most is to look at businesses and the policies that can be uh, passed, such as the one that we did, the executive order that President Obama did to limit the cell phone use and texting by uh, federal employees. And I know a number of the states have taken that action. But businesses can set the lead, the same as has been done for many businesses in adopting seatbelt use programs. Uh, 25 years ago, this, that was the avenue that we took with expanding seatbelt use, is to work with corporations and companies and show them the value of increasing belt use by their employees because it actually makes good business sense. It it reduces their health care costs and also the loss of uh, individuals off of work. And then they take that home and it translates to uh, their families. So businesses have a great place in helping to lead an issue and to actually make a difference in the amount of cell phone use that's being uh, 
it's happening out there. Many salespeople, many people who are involved in work think it's expected of them to answer the phone because they might miss an important call. Setting that policy within your company to let them know that's not your expectation, that it can wait till they get where to their destination is very important and will help in a, in a leadership role in this country in changing the culture of using cell phones and texting. On uh, distraction.gov, there are a number of tools there that you can use. All of the information that's been provided here today and about the specifics about the agency's plan is available to you there, but also uh, materials for promoting uh, anti-texting and cell phone use programs in your schools, in your communities, and in your company. And that's what this is all about here today is to, I know that all of you have already uh, drank the Kool-Aid. You don't text and drive and you don't use your cell phones. What we need to do is to get you to take action with other people within your communities and within your companies and that's how we're going to make a difference really moving it out, getting others to help us carry the water. And boy, is this important water to take. Thank you for your attention and the opportunity to chat with you over lunch. It's been my pleasure.